History as it happens, March 4th, 2021. Abraham Lincoln, racist? Are you angry? Yes! Yeah. Are you angry? Yes! Yeah. This is a revolution. There you go, bro. This is a change. You can't trust this country to tell the truth when it comes to what happens to our people, to black people. And of course, a country that does that creates these types of symbols. Abe Lincoln's remembered as the great emancipator, the savior of the union. But after a summer of racial protest, as Americans reckoned with their country's history of racial injustice, Lincoln's lesser known views are under scrutiny and some of his statues are coming down. Is that reckoning with or erasing history? A Lincoln scholar weighs in as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. Lincoln really wanted African-Americans to be citizens. Um, Lincoln said, here is a letter that I just wrote to somebody in Louisiana suggesting that African-Americans should have the vote. Hey, everybody. In the summer of 2020, when Black Lives Matter protests roiled America's cities, Confederate statues that had stood for generations came down. In some cases, they were ripped down by mobs. In others, local leaders took action, like Mayor LeVar Stoney of Richmond, home to the most prominent Confederate monuments in the country. These statues, although symbolic, have cast a shadow on the dreams of our children of color. By removing them, we can begin to heal and focus all our attention on our future. Well, I got to tell you, as a Yankee myself, I never quite understood memorializing traitors, the men who made war on the United States to preserve their peculiar institution. That is, until I learned the history behind many of those statues. They weren't erected in the immediate aftermath of the war to honor fallen heroes. They were put up much later on, towering symbols of lost cause mythology and Jim Crow. So I say good riddance to Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis. But what about the guy who led the other side in that war? His name was, um, it was Abraham Lincoln. Some of his statues are coming down too. Listen to this headline from September 2020, Associated Press in Springfield, Illinois. Douglas statue comes down, but Lincoln had racist views too. Now that headline refers to Stephen Douglas, the little giant who defeated Lincoln in the 1858 Senate race. In those debates, Lincoln made remarks about racial equality and black people that disqualify him, at least in the eyes of some of his critics, from being memorialized today. Here are a few examples. In Boston, the Emancipation statue was taken out of a public park. In Chicago, five Lincoln statues were placed on a watch list of public monuments that may be removed pending review. In San Francisco, Lincoln's name was taken off of a school. And at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, some students want a Lincoln statue taken off of campus. Nala McWhorter is the president of the Wisconsin Black Student Union, and here she is explaining her stance, the audio courtesy of WISC-TV in Madison. He was also very publicly anti-black. Um, just because he was anti-slavery doesn't mean he was pro-black. Um, he has said a lot in his presidential campaigns, his fourth um, presidential campaign speech, he said that, you know, there should be an inferior and a superior, and he believes that white people should be the superior race. We need to point out that not all these Lincoln statues are the same. Take the Emancipation statue. The original is in D.C., and there are replicas in Boston and elsewhere. It shows Lincoln standing above a crouching black man, an emancipated slave whose broken shackles lie at Lincoln's feet. It dates to 1876. Those clips you heard at the start of this episode were protesters in Washington who denounced the statue last summer because they found its depiction of the emancipated slave demeaning. They also said the statue ignores the role slaves played in their own freedom by making Lincoln look like an all-powerful emancipator. So what were Lincoln's views on race and slavery? We're going to talk about those issues in a moment with historian David S. Reynolds. He wrote a Lincoln biography that won the prestigious Lincoln Prize last year. Lincoln said, look, I have to stay in the middle because he didn't want the Union to be totally destroyed. As you'll hear in our conversation, when it comes to important historical figures, including Lincoln, public discourse often swings to one extreme or the other. Lincoln was neither a faultless hero nor an irredeemable white supremacist. 
and historians have been writing about and debating these issues for decades. But placed in the hands of activists, Lincoln's words can be used as weapons, as we're seeing in cities where his statues are under review. Now, there is an important discussion to have about Abraham Lincoln, or any historical figure for that matter. For instance, Lincoln did not always shape events in a progressive direction. Sometimes events pushed him to act, as when enslaved people began escaping to Union lines during the war. That led to the so-called Contraband Act. Lincoln also clung to colonization as a so-called solution to the problem of freed slaves well into 1863, meaning the best place for freed people would be back in Africa or somewhere else. Again, Lincoln didn't drop this idea once and for all years into the war. But Lincoln learned. He evolved. He was not Jefferson Davis or Stephen Douglas. So it seems odd that Lincoln would be lumped in with such figures when it comes to statues and memorials. Let's talk about it now with David S. Reynolds, Distinguished Professor of English and of History at the Graduate Center at City University of New York. He's the author of Abe, Abraham Lincoln in His Times, winner of the Gilder Learman Abraham Lincoln Prize and the Abraham Lincoln Institute Book Award. Great to be here, Martin. Thank you. And before I ask you about Lincoln and his views on race and slavery and how he's remembered today, I want to ask you another question. Why did you choose to write a 1,000-page biography of Old Abe when thousands of books have already been written about the man? I spent many decades investigating the culture around Lincoln and writing books on Walt Whitman, on John Brown, on people like Herman Melville and Edgar Allan Poe and Emerson. And a lot of them had things to say about Abraham Lincoln. And finally, a few years ago, Norton asked me to edit Lincoln's selected writings. And the more I read about Lincoln, the more I realized there were so many connections to his contemporary culture that had been omitted in the more than 16,000 books. Uh, written about Lincoln. There had been some excellent biographies, but they follow his life and to some degree his political debates and to some degree his context. But I'm a great believer that we all absorb our culture, both our immediate culture, the family culture, the neighborhood that we live in, but also the way all of that intersects with certain elements of the larger culture. And it's that kind of interchange that I'm really interested in in my book, Abe. You approach biography differently than, say, a strict biographer would. Yeah, I write what I call cultural biography. And it picks up from what Emerson said, because he wrote a book called Representative Men. And he was talking about Shakespeare. He said, Shakespeare just takes a bunch of old lousy plots in his contemporary (laughs) popular culture, and he... And they're all kind of, you know, crummy, you know, uh, tragic plots. And he, and he sort of absorbs it from here, from there, from everywhere. And he kind of absorbs the air that he's living in, the cultural air. And he transforms it into something really great. He even said the same thing about Lincoln, uh, because Emerson said, of all the great heroes in politics, Abraham Lincoln is the one who spans the entire range of culture. From the highest, Lincoln could recite Shakespeare by the page, and he went to the opera and everything, to the lowest. He uh, loved bawdy jokes, dirty jokes, and everything kind of in between, uh, sentimental songs and everything. So Emerson really spotlighted Lincoln as someone who, even though Lincoln had less than one year of school. That's interesting. Yeah, on the frontier, just a, a few months here when he was seven, a few months there when he was 13. But it shows you that today, as then, you can feed your mind, you can learn. Yes, today we have to go to school and all that, but sometimes the most important things are what you absorb by yourself, by your own curiosity. And just so our listeners know, I have no problem with the fact that you wrote a 1,000-page biography of Abe Lincoln. Uh, My friends often tease me about my affinity for really long books. So (laughs) thank you for explaining what led you to write the book. I'm interested if you've watched any of the CNN series on Lincoln. It spends a lot of time debating the ways in which Lincoln is remembered today, depending on which of his public statements you choose to focus on. For instance, in 1858, Lincoln said during a debate against Stephen Douglas, I am not nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. There is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together 
together on terms of social and political equality. The words of Abe Lincoln. Can you put that statement in more context for us? Yeah, he was running that year uh, in 1858 for the Senate against Stephen Douglas, who was a rampant racist. He didn't uh, blink about his racism. He said it's a white man's government, and it, it will be a white man's government forever. And the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. It only means white European-based men. He didn't even uh, mention women. It doesn't include black people and use the N-word left and right. And so uh, Lincoln was in dialogue with him. And finally, someone forced him to state his uh, feelings on the issue. And in kind of grocery list fashion, he went, well, one, two, three, four. Okay, I have never said Black people should serve on juries or, or vote or that kind of thing. He was being very cagey because Illinois, where they were talking, debating, had the worst Black law of any uh, law in the United States. It was called the Negro Exclusion Act, and it means that if you were a Black person not already in Illinois, you couldn't stay there for more than 10 days, or else you were going to get a large fine and maybe be cast into prison. So that's the environment that uh, Lincoln was speaking in. He was running for office. And also notice that he doesn't say, I never will support these rights for Black people. Uh, he says, I never have and I don't now. But in the future, he became extremely close to people like Frederick Douglass, who called him the least prejudiced white person he had ever met. Same thing was said by um, such African Americans as Sojourner Truth. Martin Delaney, who was way beyond Black Lives Matter, as we would call it today, was a real radical. That's quite a statement from Frederick Douglass, considering he was close with William Lloyd Garrison. Well, Frederick Douglass was one of the most radical abolitionists of that era. And at first, Frederick Douglass had suspicions about Abraham Lincoln. He felt that he was too slow on making the Civil War a specifically anti-slavery war. So he, he held Lincoln in suspicion for the first couple of years in the war. But when he met Lincoln personally a couple of times in the White House, and when Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, he realized two things. First of all, Lincoln really wanted African Americans to be citizens. Um, Lincoln said, here is a letter that I just wrote to somebody in Louisiana suggesting that African Americans should have the vote. And then Lincoln goes on and does become the first president to publicly recommend the vote for African Americans. And Frederick Douglass also noted what he called the complete lack of prejudice against African-Americans, more so than any other white person that Douglass had met. And he knew, he knew people like John Brown. He knew people like uh, William Lloyd Garrison. So, yeah. So Lincoln's views evolved over time. I'd like to know where you stand in the current debate we're having in our country today about Lincoln and whether his name should be taken off of schools, his statue should be taken down. Critics say some of these statues have depictions of black people that are demeaning. Yeah, I mean, there's a statue called the Emancipation Memorial that was recently removed. A copy of it was removed from Boston. The statue was removed from Boston in December of 2020. And that statue, there are recastings of it in several places. They've been attacked and defaced, supposedly because Lincoln was a racist. Now, let's revisit that statue. It was designed by an African-American architect. It was funded by African-Americans. It was dedicated by Frederick Douglass in 1876. Why do people protest against it? Okay, it shows Lincoln standing, and there's an African-American who's breaking his chains and crouching and looking up at Lincoln. So, oh, this makes uh, Lincoln a racist. They're not on the same level. Uh, puts Lincoln above. This, this uh, statue was funded you know, by African-Americans. Th this was the expression uh, of their appreciation for him breaking the chains for four million enslaved people. And as a matter of fact, Martin Delaney worshipped Lincoln, was appointed by Lincoln uh, as an officer in the army. And when Lincoln died, he cried for an hour. Now, mind you, this guy was beyond Black Lives Matter. I mean, he was, you know, he was 
super duper radical. Okay, and uh, and when when Lincoln dies, he wants to fund a statue, and he called it a purely African statue of a woman, African woman, crouching and looking up, not at Lincoln, just looking up at the sky. Lincoln is, isn't even there, but she's cr totally crouching, but she's rising up with her hands up, and she's crying like millions of tears. And he wanted this uh, statue, which never actually was made, but he wanted it to be funded by a penny from each of the 4 million enslaved people who were emancipated as a result of Lincoln and the Civil War and all of that. So it's totally mistaken, absolutely mistaken to look upon uh, the statue as racist in, in any sense. And it's totally mistaken to uh, remove the name Abraham Lincoln from a high school in San Francisco. So how should we have a productive and nuanced discussion about complicated figures from the past? Most important thing to do is for Americans to try to be as informed as possible about people like Jefferson and Lincoln in their own context, which is why I write books like Abe. I put him in his times. We can't impose today's point of view on the past. We have to understand them in his times. We have to realize that when the Emancipation Proclamation came out, everyone from Frederick Douglass to so many African-American people were just absolutely overjoyed, overjoyed. We have to realize that Lincoln made that war a war against slavery, not just a war to save the Union, but he really wanted to make it a war against slavery by midpoint in the war so that at the end of the war, as the Spielberg film Lincoln shows, he was doing anything he could to get the 13th Amendment passed that abolished slavery in the Constitution. So he was completely dedicated to that. Then he becomes first president publicly to endorse African-American suffrage. John Wilkes Booth was in the audience that day. He, he said, I'm going to, you know, this mean, means citizenship for N. I'm going to put him through. And then three days later, he killed uh, Lincoln. So in a sense, he becomes a sacrifice for African-American voting and citizenship rights. And, you know, this is the kind of thing that people don't think about when they cherry pick. OK, they don't realize that. And they have to think about it. When uh, Lincoln walked into uh, the fallen Confederate capital, Richmond, Virginia, he was absolutely mobbed by emancipated black people. I mean, and, and, and they were shouting glory, you know, glory, 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 you know, God, they almost deified him. So something the Black Lives Matter protests did accomplish last summer, and I think this is a positive thing. They revived the discussion about our history of racial injustice. On the one hand, some would say the U.S. has always been racist and white supremacist and that the Constitution was pro-slavery. But there was also an anti-slavery political culture in our country right from the beginning. Yeah, basically the entire Republican Party which arose in the 1850s, became um, profoundly anti-slavery, although the Constitution seemed to condone slavery. So the big goal of the Republican Party was really to prevent the westward spread of slavery and keep it contained where it was with the realization that eventually it would die off. But so, so Lincoln, he hated slavery and his fellow Republicans hated slavery but they felt they had to confine themselves to the Constitution. Whereas John Brown said, the heck with the Constitution, and he went down south with arms and a few men to try to start a slave rebellion that he hoped would topple slavery. So Lincoln wanted to work within the Constitution, but you know, he said, we're, we're not going to allow slavery to expand. Uh, there's no way, because we hate slavery. We know it's totally unjust. And basically, the founding fathers tolerated slavery, but they didn't, did not want it to expand. Let's talk some more about Lincoln's views on slavery and what you learned in researching your book. He was called everything from a moderate to a tyrant to an abolitionist in sheep's clothing, so to speak, to someone who wasn't interested in forcefully moving against slavery at all, uh, both during his time and now. He was attacked savagely by uh, radicals, radical abolitionists as being too slow on slavery. But 
He was also attacked savagely from the conservative side as being a so-called, what was called then a Negro worshiper, someone who was totally bowing down to, to black people. So Lincoln said, look, I have to stay in the middle because he didn't want the union to be totally destroyed. Uh, when he was elected uh, and when he came to office, 11 Southern states formed their own nation, supposedly with its own constitution, its own president, its Congress, a different nation. He, he had to remain a centrist because he said, you know, if we lose Kentucky, we're going to lose everything. He was talking about the border states like Kentucky, uh, Tennessee, Missouri, that were still part of the Union, the North, and yet they had slaves. He said, if we lose one of these states, we're just going to lose, lose the war and slavery will be here forever. So he was forced to be a centrist, even though underneath, as several people said, he was quite radical. He might not have been nominated to be the president for the Republican Party, correct, if he had not Yeah, been. yeah, yeah, probably not because he was perceived as a centrist, as a moderate. There was a radical wing, progressive wing, and there was a very conservative wing to the Republican Party. And he was known as sort of a a dark horse centrist, uh, that kind of thing, someone who was moderate. So, and that's why he was elected. Yeah, for sure. Adamantly opposed to the expansion of slavery, but willing to say repeatedly in public that he would not touch slavery where it already existed. Yeah. And he drew the line, you know, uh, in the first inaugural address, he, he told the South, look, we have to be friends and we can't be enemies. This is before the war. But he said, we own forts down there, down south. We, the, the, the United States has forts and, you know, we're, we're going to have to provide for and protect our forts. And when Fort Sumter was attacked on April 14th, 1861, several of his closest advisors, most of them were saying, oh, let, the, let Fort Sumter go and let's see what happens to Fort Pickens. And, but he said, no, no I mean, you know, that's, that's it. They, they attacked our fort, and he called up 75,000 troops, and the war began. So he was very, very firm. He was not James Buchanan, in other words. Uh, yeah, exactly. the worst president yeah, Buchan- we've ever had. Yeah, Buchanan was a real compromiser. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, when it comes to any issue at any time in our history, the idealists always want those who are in power to go faster. And it sounds like Lincoln faced those same forces during his time. Yeah, exactly. He had the wisdom. He said, I hate slavery as much as any radical abolitionist. He hated slavery. He thought it was unjust. And he was personally close to a lot of African Americans in Springfield, Illinois, where he lived. And then to people like Sojourner Truth and Martin Delaney and and Frederick Douglass in the White House and on and on and on. And yet, to save the Union, he had to remain, at least publicly, a centrist for much of the time. So a lot of people saw him as being too slow uh, and too too moderate. Yeah, yeah. The idealists, um, and, and and there were a lot of uh, you know other idealists who, who just found him tardy. But when push came to shove, he was pretty darn tough about his beliefs because Jefferson Davis came to him when both sides were very weary of the war and they said, he said, why don't we just make a deal here of two separate nations? And, and uh, Lincoln said, only if you give up slavery. That's, that's the only, and, and Davis said, oh, no, oh, never, never. And, uh, and there's Lincoln, no point for the Confederacy then, right? <laughs> they were yeah, fighting yeah. to preserve it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, Lincoln said, no, no, sorry. And then they continued the war and finally the North, one. And Lincoln thought he might lose the 1864 election early that year, and he was facing some pretty ferocious opposition among Northern Democrats who did want to seek an accommodation with the South, right? Yeah, and the 1864 election could have gone to his opponent, McClellan. And in August, before the November election, August, uh, Lincoln actually wrote a sealed memo to his uh, cabinet saying, It appears that I'm going to lose the election, but I want to preserve a very smooth transition of power to my successor. But 
then what happened, of course, is in uh, September, there was great news from Sherman in Georgia. Grant uh, was doing very well in Virginia. All of a sudden, the war weariness of the North uh, turned into kind of war enthusiasm. So it turned out McClellan did not win that election. But yeah, I mean, Lincoln was uh, very savagely attacked before August from both sides, both from uh, radical abolitionists and by conservatives as well. And it really looked in August like he was going to lose that election. Amazing. You mentioned John Brown before. I'll take this moment to let our listeners know that you wrote an excellent biography of John Brown some years ago. It's titled John Brown, Abolitionist. Both he and the other radical abolitionist, William Lloyd Garrison, that we've mentioned, they believe the Constitution was irredeemable. But Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, to name two, argue differently. And I see that discussion, that debate happening today. Yeah. Lincoln said that at the time the Constitution was composed, slavery, unfortunately, was entrenched not only in the South, but 12 out of the 13 colonies that became states still had slavery. And slavery would not be banished in New York until 1827 and in New Jersey till much later. I mean, it was a factor on the American scene. And so there were certain elements of the Constitution that had to kind of bend over a little bit to the South. However, uh, Lincoln said, look, the word slavery is never used in the Constitution. People like Jefferson and Washington, even though they had slaves themselves, basically did not like the institution or saw its injustice and knew that eventually it would have to go. And as a matter of fact, uh, all the founders agreed that the slave trade should be banished by 1808. And there was the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, around the same time as the Constitution, which said slavery should not be allowed to spread northwest of the Ohio River. And he very carefully went through all the founding fathers and realized that a majority of them really wanted slavery to disappear. So he said, it's, it's not you can't just say it's a pro-slavery document. Something I find remarkable about Lincoln today was his constitutional eloquence, his ability to turn a phrase and really explain like no other president the meaning of the Constitution and the importance of the Union. Where did he get that from? Well, I mentioned that he had less than one year of schooling, but he loved to read and he loved to read poetry. He thought that poetry was the most concentrated and also most express, expressive uh, way of communicating both feeling and meaning. And he would memorize long uh, poems by Robert Burns, by Shakespeare, by Longfellow. Not that he wanted to brag. It wasn't like at a cocktail party that, oh, listen to this poem that I, that I memorized. He did it just because these poems meant so much to him. He had a thing about language. And there was once a song by the Bee Gees called Words. You know, it's only word. Mm -hmm. Words are all I have to take your heart away. And he realized that finally it was language that really mattered to so many people, not just action. He was very good at action, but, but also language. So even phrases today are sometimes used of, of Lincoln's, the better angel, angels of our nature, of the people, by the people, for the people, malice toward none. I mentioned the CNN series. I think Lincoln always matters. He seems to matter now because our country is so divided. What do you think of it? I like it. I think it's so wonderful for me anytime to see Lincoln's life in any kind of popular venue. I loved the movie that Spielberg made. I'm enjoying the CNN series. It does a a good job of covering his life from the log cabin through the Lincoln-Douglas debates and right on into the presidency. So the historians that were chosen are very, very good. I think um, the uh, recreations of the live actors are are done well, too. So let's wrap up with one more question about your scholarship and this book about Abraham Lincoln, for which you won the Lincoln Prize. So congratulations. How How long does it take to research and write? something so in-depth? 
Well, a book like this takes about a total of six years, six years. And four of those years um, were spent uh, doing the research, going to archives, uh, looking at online archives and on and on. And then two of the years were spent in actual going over my notes and writing the book. Six years. That sounds more demanding than, say, doing a podcast. David S. Reynolds, thank you for some great insights about the 16th president of the United States. On the next episode of History As It Happens, the Republican Party is often called the Party of Lincoln. Well, whose party is it now? Nobody has done more for the black community than Donald Trump. And if you look, with the exception of Abraham Lincoln, possible exception, but the exception of Abraham Lincoln, nobody has done what I've done. The past, present, and future of the GOP. That's next as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times.